Good morning and welcome to May 1st, 2022. Oh, the month of May, what beauty it brings and what a joy it is to think about the hopeful things that God has in store for us. We appreciate you joining us today. If you are a shut-in or unable to get out for one reason or another, thank you for sharing in worship with us. We, for the time being and possibly further into the future, will continue to offer our sermons digitally. But if you're able, we'd love for you to join us in person at Hickory Plains Church the Nazarene. Before we get started into God's Word, let's, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the promise of summertime. Thank you for the spring when new life comes forward and we get to enjoy those things. But dear Heavenly Father, much of the world is in pain, probably a bigger percentage of it than we would ever even allow ourselves to imagine. And while we enjoy the moments of your peace and your hope, help us to not let our compassion disappear for those that don't have what we have your peace and your comfort. Dear Heavenly Father, just help us to be bearers of those things. Help us to learn uh, uh, in greater strength that it isn't a matter of I'm right and you're wrong, but a matter of you desperately need salvation and the hope of joy everlasting in Christ our Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for these things. In your name I pray. Amen. Well, deciding what to preach each Sunday is one of the greatest struggles of my mind. I want to be relevant to the needs that I of the people I'm speaking to, and sermon prep consumes a great deal of my time, which means when I'm prepping, I'm usually feeding my own spirit as well. The question of what to preach permeates many conversations and shop talk that I have with fellow ministers in my circle. The best advice I've ever heard is this, though. The Holy Spirit brings you as leader to the place He needs you to be because your sheep or your congregation need that too. In other words, we must be all in this together. I think of that every moment. This week, though, this sermon's for me. I can only believe maybe, though, you might need it too. We are still in the 40 days between the resurrection and Pentecost, the birth of the church. So again, I want to peer into the characters' lives that are marked in this period of time and look especially close, I know, I know, again, at the 20th and 21st chapters of John. These early believers, these apostles, have become quite a fascination to me. They were real, walking, talking people, not exaggerated works of fiction. The great imaginations of authors and creators do amuse me. I watched a video this week called If the Disciples Had Cell Phones, and yes, it was entertaining and somewhat on point. There are a plethora of fictional writings that bring these characters and their times to life in both print and technicolor, for those of us who remember what a big deal that once was. However, it is so important to stay connected with great fidelity to the scripture And that is my objective, while highlighting the impossible situation these fragile believers found themselves in, contrasted against the divine accomplishments of a loving and good Savior that made them strong, persevering, and victorious to the end. Somewhere on our journey to maturity, the uh, the ordinary human learns a debilitating habit, waiting for the other shoe to drop or for the scary background music of the world to overtake one's heart's hymn of praise, all the while waiting for the curtain to fall and everyone to agree, well, that's how we thought things would turn out as well. Um, And, you know, not knowing that Jesus is waiting in the wings for his just watch this moment that will far exceed anything we've ever hoped for. That's what today's message is about. Life brings darkness. Grief is real for each one of us. The future is unknown to all of us, no matter our profession or the bottom line in our financial portfolio or how deep our retirement's pocket is. The only certainty is that one day this body will be no more and the spirit will be elsewhere. Jesus came and died, walked and talked so your elsewhere could be with him. Here is a brief recap of the generally accepted moments of Resurrection Day. 
Early in the morning, while it was still dark, two or possibly more women groped their way from Bethany and Jerusalem toward the tomb. They did not carry lanterns to light their way. It was dangerous, and they wanted no attention drawn to themselves or their task. As the sun broke over the horizon, they arrived. Sometime before this, angels rolled away the stone, and Jesus emerged from the tomb alive. Frightened and dazed, the guards had fled to tell the priests who had placed them there, and together they would devise a comfortable lie that is even still today believed by some. Mary Magdalene, ahead of her group, found the tomb empty and turned and ran to tell Peter and John. Moments later, the other women drew near, see and hear the angels, and hurry away to, by another route to tell other disciples. Seconds later, Peter and John reached the tomb. Peter rushes in and sees nothing and is left wondering. John notices the face cloth folded and he believes. This isn't a case of the missing corpse, but a glorious resurrected Savior. John knows. Mary Magdalene followed Peter and John back to the tomb, and then she remains alone weeping. Then she sees the angels, and Jesus appears to her. Soon after, Jesus appears to the other woman, women as well. All this happened in a matter of minutes, less than an hour. These biblical characters found themselves in impossible situations. For about three years, they had lived and walked with Jesus, learning and growing. All they knew is that a new kingdom would be established to change the world order, and they would be a part of it. Just as James and John wanted their proper place in court, and Judas wanted to see the prophets of this new world, no one had any measuring rod except their own life's experience. Political powers come and go, while some prosper, others wither away. But this new government would last forever. Rome didn't know what was coming its way, and they were excited to be a part of it. But then, as the victim of hatred, man manipulation, falsehoods, Jesus was arrested and tried. It was nothing short of a ridiculous kangaroo court, and everyone truly knew it. The demon of the world seemed to have won the day, and all was lost. Hope was gone. But then came morning. How many times have I said that in my sermons in the past several weeks? Then came morning. Here are a few realities facing these faithful, hopeful few. John saw empty burial dressing and understood the magnitude of a folded cloth. Jesus wasn't gone for good. Yet Peter, the impulsive, temperamental man of so many good attributes, still stumbled over instant reaction. He was oblivious to the greater things going on around him. In Mark's Gospel, the writer calls attention to a message specifically for this man who knew bitter humiliation over his denial of the Lord. Had he been disowned? No, there is a very distinct, distinctive message, especially for Peter, in Mark chapter 16, verses 6 and 7. Don't be alarmed, he said. This, you are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him? But go and tell his disciples, and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. There was a message from heaven to tell Peter, you're included in the good news too. Peter stepped out of the boat and walked on water. His mother-in-law was healed. He tried to protect Jesus with a weapon and cut off the ear of a servant. And Jesus unhesitatingly reattached the servant's ear and commanded Peter to put away his sword. It wasn't needed. Peter had no excuse after all of these things, not to blindly trust. Yet, he was frightened intimidated, confused, and he failed on an epic scale. Still, Jesus made a point to let Peter know all hope was not gone, but very much alive, and his Savior was the forgiver of much and the giver of more. Again, there was no time frame or itinerary given by Jesus. He spoke in the immediate, referencing the eternal. These men had no idea how long Jesus meant to stay on earth. Would he be with them in physical spirit until, the, until they all grew old and died? Now what would this kingdom look like with a, a spirit crown prince? Things were growing curiouser and curiouser. 
Jesus still had work to do teaching and molding because they did not yet have all they would need to see them through. As I spoke last week, Jesus told Mary Magdalene in John 20, verse 17, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. When we hold on to something, the intention is to stabilize it, to keep it from leaving, falling, or drifting, a glue of sorts that creates a static position. When Mary saw Jesus, all she knew was that he was back and all would be well. She was saved. The kingdom of God had arrived, and once again, she had an advocate and protector. But Jesus was expressing, Mary, just wait. There is so much more. She referred to him as Lord and my Lord, but now Jesus is making a direct connection to her place with his father and his eternal family. Mary will have all she ever imagined she would need and all she ever dreamed of. And then there was Thomas, the twin. I refused to call him the doubter. He was analytical, sure, and probably a little skeptical, but he was faithful in his ways. When Jesus said he would return to Bethany upon Lazarus' death, the current political tension was felt by everyone, and they knew it was dangerous. Yet Thomas said, Let us go, that we may die with him. That is in John chapter 11, verse 16. Thomas had no expectation beyond obedience and loyalty, but like all the others, Jesus' death left more questions asked than answered. In John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29, this is what Jesus says to Thomas. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But they said to them, But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. The the doors were locked. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord, my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. First of all, Jesus came and gave peace. Jesus offered this every time he came back into these people's lives. Peace. Did he demand it? No, he gave it. It is an essential part of his presence then and now. He offered Thomas what Thomas needed, and then Jesus continued, The scope of believers far exceeds those who have seen me. Know and live what I have promised and is yet unseen. That's hope. Generations will come who won't see what you have seen. Go and declare that I am life, I am love, I am salvation. And then there was Peter. Do you think he struggled in those days post-crucifixion to gaze at his reflection in the waters of the sea? He knew his own heart. He knew he loved Jesus, and he was sorry for what he had done. But it was the elephant in the room, so to speak. It invaded every thought. No matter what he had ever done before, faithful and true, when it really mattered, he had crumbled. He had failed. (coughs) Excuse me. And then Jesus found Peter his brother Andrew and James and John, and he called them. This is from John chapter 21, verses 1 through 18. And yes, it's lengthy, but I'm almost done. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, We'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the, disciples, then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, 
It is the Lord. Ah, once again, John got the clues when Simon seemed oblivious to the obvious. But as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water again. Wonderful Peter jumped out of the boat to go to Jesus. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have caught, just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have some breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. Does this remind you of anything? Maybe the Last Supper or the many, many times Jesus had fed the multitudes and taught them. And, did this, and then he did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. You know, the lambs, the young and the helpless. That's not in the scripture. That's my addition. But I'm going back to scripture. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Once again, Gretchen's version of this is, be a shepherd, be a minister. And back to scripture. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Ah, the Lord gave Peter his marching orders. He said, go. Jesus brings enlightenment and understanding in ways that are miraculous. That is part of the divine accomplishment of an impossible situation. Our response must be an unwavering trust, an expectant faith, a logic-defying peace, but most of all, what the disciples were sent forward armed with, the humble grace and mercy that reached down and saved them too and must be shared and spread across the globe. You know, pride turns angels into demons. It did. That's why Satan was cast out of heaven. Pride turns angels into demons, but expectant faith breeds hope for everyone. These people knew not what to hope for, but they knew all they needed was coming, and it is for you as well. Won't you trust and believe? Let us pray. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the, the word, if nothing else that you've ever done for us. You have given us your voice, your breath in the Bible stories that we read and love. Thank you for coming alive to us in that way and as many other ways that you come alive to us. But I ask this morning that you touch the hearts of the hearers and help them to understand how significant these things that happened after the resurrection and before the ascension were in your message to us today. Help us, for those of us that are believers, help us to know we are called. And for those who are non-believers, Help them to hear and help them to find, help us to find them with your voice as through us as the conduit. We praise you for who you are and we love you with all our heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And now, the Lord bless and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. You are loved. Have a wonderful day.